Hi everyone, today we're very pleased to uh, welcome Claire Watt from Northumbria University. So just as a bit of background, Claire started her research career at the British Antarctic Survey where she completed her PhD. She then held positions at um, the University of Alberta and the University of Reading. And since then, she started as a professor at Northumbria University earlier this year. Um, Claire has also held invited positions at the UK Space Agency and the European Space Agency. Um, Claire's research interests include understanding Earth's outer radiation belt, specifically the kinetic plasma physics, numerical modeling and stochastic processes that take place there. So I'll hand it over to you, Claire, for the um, seminar and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Jasmine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending um, this seminar. I'm very excited to be talking to you today about Earth's outer radiation belt. So it's a real pleasure to be giving this um, seminar. Many thanks to Jasmine and the other organizers um, for both organizing the seminar series, which we were talking before about um, how, how useful it is to keep the community going during these very unusual times. Um, and also for inviting me to give one because I always love talking about the outer radiation belts. So. I've skipped on to my second slide. Um, traditionally with a seminar, I like to talk about the acknowledgements first, and it's usually because I get so excited whilst I'm talking about science that I kind of forget to do it at the end. So one of the um, great things about science, I always think, is working with a team of other people. And I'm so lucky to have such great colleagues. So here's a huge long list of them, um, which who would I like to acknowledge. Um, and additionally, I'd like to acknowledge um, how grateful I am to NERC and STFC for continuing to fund um, our program of research, first at Reading and now at Northumbria. So today, as I said, my focus is on the outer radiation belt. So I'm going to start talking about what that is, where it is. Um, I'm specifically talking about Earth's outer radiation belt, but hopefully those of you who are interested in the other planets will see um, the sort of physics behind the outer, the, the Earth's outer radiation belt and realize um, how transferable some of those physical processes are. Um, those physical processes in a nutshell are wave particle interactions. Um, and so I'm gonna describe what they are, what they do, um, describe how observations um, are used to construct our models of wave particle interactions in the radiation belt. What the challenges are in modeling these things, especially due to the differences in scale um, between the sort of microscopic wave particle interaction, the macroscopic consequence in the, in the outer radiation belt. But my biggest um, obsession, if you like, is the variability of those wave particle interactions. And today I want to convince you that that variability is very important. So here we go. This is a sketch of the Earth's magnetosphere. But if I am brutally honest, and I'm talking about variability, it's a temporally and spatially averaged or smoothed sketch of the Earth's magnetosphere. Space is a fairly turbulent, noisy place. And so when we have sketches like this, they're very useful for telling us a bit about the geography of the system, if you like. But we have to remember that they're highly idealized. Anyway the geography of the system. Um, in this sketch, the sun is way off to the left of the diagram. It emits the solar wind, which suffuses through the entire heliosphere. So it's coming in from the left. Um, it encounters the bow shock uh, just upstream of the earth. Um, the solar wind is shocked, so it's heated, it's slowed, um, forming the magneto sheath, which you can just see underneath my box there at the top um, of the diagram. The red boundary, the red interface uh, indicated on this diagram is um, the Manita pause. So this is the boundary between solar wind plasma and uh, plasma that's dominated by the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and then within that red cavity is the Earth's magnetosphere, um, which has many different regions in it. And the different regions have uh, different characteristics. Some are more dense than others. Some are more energetic than others. So talking about energy, let's have a think about the kind of typical temperatures of different regions of this particular um, sketch of the Earth's magnetosphere. So 
out in the solar wind, the kind of temperature you're thinking about, the average energies of the electrons in the plasma is maybe about 10 EV or so. Um, note for anybody who uh, likes to think about temperature in terms of Kelvin, uh, I'm afraid I do not because Kelvin's too small a unit for the kind of temperatures that I'm thinking of. Um, and so I usually think of them in EV. Um, so yeah, electron temperature in the solar wind, typically round about 10 EV, obviously, as I was saying, it's very variable. Once that solar wind gets through the bow shock, then the temperature um, is, is obviously going to be raised because through that shock, the plasma gets heated and temperatures there in the Manita sheath are around about 30 EV. Now, when you get inside the magnetosphere, things get very exciting in terms of average temperatures, in terms of the energies of, of the plasma, or specifically the energies of the electrons. So inside the Earth's magnetosphere, as I said, there was many of these different regions. Um, and the ones I want to focus on most are the ones right in the middle of the, of the plot there. Um, the red kind of swirly bits, which I, I like in this, in this plot because they show the variability. Um, the red's indicating the two vanillin radiation belts. So there's an outer, outer belt, which is predominantly um, energetic electrons, and the inner belt, which is predominantly energetic protons. Um, now, the temperature of the outer radiation belts is not as easy to define, because all of the other temperatures I've been talking about are when you consider the plasma as a whole, as one single component. So in the solar wind, you've got a single component about 10 EV inside the magnetosphere. If we go to the plasma sheet, which is the region on the tail, hopefully you can see my mouse pointer um, and the, the region on the, the night side of the earth where you can see this temperature of a thousand EV, the plasma there is very heated. It's very, very energetic. But the radiation belts that I want to talk about, which are in the middle of the diagram there, um, they're more like an extra population on top of the background population. It's not that the um, radiation belts are um, all that's going on in that particular region of space close to the Earth. They're, um, they're like a, an extra population. So the plots I'm showing here show phase-based density or the plasma distribution function as a function of energy. Um, and there's two examples here. They've been taken from geosynchronous orbits. So that's about 6.6 Earth radii away from the center of the Earth. It's towards the edges of the outer radiation belt, sort of um, in an average sense. And uh, you can see the, the datas with the symbols and uh, various fits have been made with the lines. Um, and the datas, the fact that, that you could fit these data points with two different lines suggests that there are more than one plasma population suggests that there's two, you could describe the plasma as two different populations with different temperatures. The um, slope of the lines indicates uh, the kind of temperature that you have, and uh, at least with these axes. And um, you can see that there, there is a very high temperature, a very energetic component, um, sort of uh, these data points here and the shallow line, this is a very energetic component that is a radiation belt. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to move that slide. This part is the kind of background colder plasma, and then the, the high energy part is the, is the radiation belt itself. So the radiation belt, as I've been trying to say, the, the theme through this talk is variability. The radiation belt itself is highly variable. Uh, this movie is showing a visualization of data from a low energy spacecraft that's sampling uh, trapped particles that are in the radi Earth's radiation belts. Um, and then uh, if you make a sample, you can kind of reconstruct what the radiation belts look like because they're quite uniform and azimuth. Um, and so you can see now the, the uh, variability as the clock ticks forward, there's days um, ticking forward in the, in the bottom left of the, of the movie there. So it's a speeded up movie but you can still see significant variability in the extent of the radiation belts. The color that you're seeing in this movie is showing the number of high energy electrons above a particular, um, above a particular energy threshold. So you can see that, it, that the extent changes, the number of high energy electrons changes, um, the kind of patterns, sometimes it's very, there's a lot of red, sometimes it's only a, a, thin, um, a thin band of red. This is changing all the time, it's changing daily, um, which is, is very interesting for us. So keep in the back of your minds that the variability of the electrons in the radiation belts is kind of hours, days, that kind of thing. 
Now we can model, we have very successful models of this variability. And I'm showing here um, a sort of uh, like an outer radiation belt reanalysis. So where data and models have been combined in order to provide an overview of what the radiation belts have looked like for the last 30 years. So this is not days and, and hour timescales anymore. There's much larger timescales. Um, so for each of the top two panels on this plot, um, the vertical axis is showing L star, which is a, um, is a similar uh, property to the, the distance away from the Earth, but it's really talking about the uh, drift paths of trapped electrons in the radiation belt. And then time goes along the horizontal axis, and the color that you're seeing in the top two panels is indicating the differential flux of electrons above uh, sorry, at a particular energy. So the top panel is 800 keV electrons, and the bottom panel, so the middle panel is 2000 keV or 2 MeV electrons. So you can see this variability is happening um, on many different timescales, uh, sort of uh, monthly, seasonal, annual type timescales, in addition to the solar cycle um, timescales. Um, if you look very, very closely, it's kind of, um, you can convince yourself that the, the largest enhancements in the two MeV population, at least, are happening in the descending phase of the solar cycles. There's a strange period in 2009 where the radiation belts seem to disappear entirely. Um, and so, um, yes, there's an awful lot of variability happening on an awful, over many, many different timescales. Now, why are the radiation belts important? I mean, other than being a really fascinating physics problem, um, they happen to be where our most useful satellite orbits lie. So this diagram here is showing um, a snapshot of the location of the outer road and, and inner radiation belts. And some of the orbits that you can see um, on this include GPS or a GNSS type orbits, which are medium Earth orbits, um, and the equatorial geosynchronous orbits. And these, as I say, very useful orbits for satellite assets to do communications, to do um, um, satellite entertainment, to uh, keep uh, different parts of the world uh, talking to one another. And, um, and yeah, they're right in the heart of the outer radiation belt. So the weather, the variability of this outer radiation belt is really important. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm having, there we go. Um, and the, the high energy electrons, the electrons that are above say 0.5 MeV are dangerous, dangerous to spacecraft. Um, they can accumulate on different parts of the spacecraft um, leading to surface discharge because obviously if you have different materials on the surface of your spacecraft, some of them can charge in different ways, gives you a potential difference, you can end up with a discharge. Um, and then there's also the danger with the very high energetic um, electrons of deep dielectric charging. This is essentially where electrons penetrate through the body of a spacecraft, um, disrupting electronics and really causing um, uh, very unpredictable um, effects on your satellite. Um, and this is why they are sometimes known as killer electrons. So the electrons of the radiation belts can literally prevent a satellite from operating in the way that it should. And um, that's not always a recoverable thing. <laughs> So what's my own physics interest, uh, beyond the fact that I want to do something that is useful in space physics, um, what's, what's my physics interest? Well, to create this particular word cloud, I took all the abstracts I think I've ever done um, and ran it through uh, a world, word cloud software. And you can see it's all about waves, really. Um, yeah, waves is really what my physics interest is. And it turns out that the outer radiation belt is one of the most to me, interesting kinetic wave phenomena in our near Earth space, or indeed in the solar system. These wave particle interactions operate in other magnetospheres in the solar wind. And yeah, I just find them fascinating. So even after a career that started off with looking at wave particle interactions in reconnection regions, moved on to wave particle interactions uh, to do a rural acceleration um, above the Earth, Ultimately, I think that doing wave particle interactions in the Earth's outer radiation belt is kind of the pinnacle of the wave particle interaction problem. So why, why are waves important for the outer radiation belt? And as I say, it's because of these wave particle interactions. 
the plasma in near air space is space is so tenuous that there are no collisions. Um, so it's so sparse. There's not enough of it. The the amount of electron, electron, or electron, proton, or uh, proton neutral, neutral or whatever, but the amount of actual collisions is very, very small. So as a result, in order to get rid of any um, odd gradients, if you like, or, or, or kind of um, uh, sources of free energy in the plasma, um, collisions are not going to do it, which is what they would ordinarily do in a gas or a more dense plasma. Um, what happens instead is that the electrons and the protons and the alphas, and um, they all interact with electromagnetic waves. Um, and the this interaction is a bit like a collision in that the momentum, the, the size of the momentum and the direction of the momentum can change as a result of um, the electron taking part in a wave particle interaction, but it's slightly different. And I want to talk a little bit about how it's slightly different from a, from a collision. So as I say, wave particle interaction is where you have a charged particle and it interacts with an electromagnetic magnetic wave. Now, um, the reason why it's different from a collision is that the strength of that interaction depends very much on the velocity or the momentum of the plasma particle to begin with. So um, you have an um, electromagnetic wave and I have an example, very simple example in the bottom right plot. Um, you can imagine that that electromagnetic wave is heading off to the right. Uh, so at one time it's the blue line and the, the next time it's the orange line. So it's progressing towards the right. It has an electric field because it's an electromagnetic wave. And that thing, that is the thing that provides a force. So um, if an electron interacts with that electric field, then it may experience um, a force. Now, whether that force there's a net force or not depends very much on the velocity of the particle. So let's imagine that we've got uh, two electrons and I've got two velocities for electron. Velocity of electron one in sort of green at the top of the slide. Velocity of electron two is in kind of light blue uh, in the middle of the slide. And here's the phase velocity of the wave. This is how fast the wave is moving towards the right. For electron one, it's got a very slow velocity relative to the phase velocity. And what's likely to happen is that the electric field that it experiences is a sinusoid because it's essentially sitting there and the wave passes over the top of it. And so if we look at the electric field uh, variation, it's a sine wave. Um, and so if I think of the net force that that electron experiences, it's probably about zero. However, the second electron, electron two, which is in the middle here, it has a long velocity arrow. I'm trying to indicate that it has roughly the same velocity as the phase velocity of the wave. So instead of experiencing a sinusoidal wave, it will experience uh, an electric field that's almost constant. So let's imagine that it's down here at the uh, trough of the electromagnetic wave. As it's moving along with the wave at nearly the same speed as the wave, it's always going to be experiencing that trough. So if I integrate up the force that it experiences, it will have a net force acting on it. And it's that net force that gives you the wave particle interaction. So the efficiency, the strength of the wave particle interaction very much depends on the velocity of um, the electron or the proton or whichever charged particle it is that's undergoing that uh, wave particle interaction. You can think of it a bit like surfing. Now, I don't know if any of you have actually had the opportunity to go surfing or boogie boarding, but basically you can't just catch a wave sitting about. If you sit about like the, the two people in this uh, diag photograph on the top left are, are doing, um, then all that will happen is they bob about in the wave. Um, the waves, the water waves go past them. They just bob up and down. Um, they won't be accelerated by those waves. However, if you paddle along in the same direction as the waves, as this gentleman is doing here, then um, you can catch that wave. That wave will literally accelerate you towards the beach. Um, and that's how you successfully <laughs> um, surf. I mean, there's obviously a lot more to it. You have to actually stand up on the board and those kind of things. But what you're doing when you're surfing is exactly what happens during a wave particle interaction in space, is that some of the particles are effectively just sitting around relative to the wave and all that happens is they bob about. But some of them are paddling along with the wave, as it were, and um, do get accelerated, do get their momentum changed by the wave. 
what does that wave particle interaction do to the actual plasma? Well, if you have a parallel electric field component in your wave, then um, what happens is that some of those electrons that are traveling at the same phase speed as the wave will experience these wave particle interactions and you end up with heating in the parallel direction. Now, it's not going to necessarily be heating in kind of both directions. You can end up with preferential heating in one direction versus another. Um, so you can also have current drive and that kind of thing. If you have a perpendicular electric field component, which is actually um, often a lot more usual, um, then you can end up with per perpendicular heating and that will happen in both directions because it's a cyclotron resonance and um, your, your cyclotron motion uh, gives you this sort of isotropic, if you like, uh, heating in the in the V perp direction. Um, and you can also scatter in pitch angles. So you could, pitch angle is the angle between the velocity of the electron and the magnetic field direction. And so if you change its perpendicular velocity, but you don't change its parallel velocity, then you end up changing its pitch angle as well. And so there are all of these um, heating mechanisms or the sort of current drive mechanisms uh, happen as a result of these wave particle interactions. And they're going to be energy specific. They're gonna be velocity specific, but that means that they're gonna be energy specific. Now, if we're trying to model wave particle interactions and we have a huge, we have a huge range of different theoretical um, methods to do that. Now we need kinetic theory because you have this energy specific interaction. So you can't just use a fluid or an MHD description of the plasma. You have to separate everything up by energy or by velocity in order to get the, uh, the proper description of the wave particle interaction. But there's obviously different ways we can do this. Linear theory, which is where you make a bunch of assumptions about, I've got a background um, situation and I've got small perturbations and um, I can um, ignore any nonlinear terms and I can expand everything out. That's great. Gives you the rates of energy transfer um, as a result of wave particle interactions, can tell you the growth rate of the process or the damping rate of the process. Um, that's great. The theory is very, very difficult to be kind of tractable in anything other than idealized situations. If we go to the other end of the scale, you can do a full non-linear kinetic simulation. You can use a particle and cell code, you can use a Vlasov code, um, or any of the various hybrid uh, in-between models that there are to talk about the full non-linear evolution and all those different details of the wave particle interaction. But again, you're kind of limited to very idealized situations um, where, um, yeah, where you can't have very many gradients or anything like that. What we use in radiation belts is quasi-linear theory, which is somewhere in between the two. It's not linear theory. There is some interaction between the plasma and the waves. Um, and there's some kind of feedback from the, the, the wave growth onto the plasma. Um, but it's not fully non-linear because that's very, very sort of computationally expensive. But the great thing about quasi-linear theory is that you can use it in a sort of global magnetosphere, which is the outer radiation belts are a global phenomenon. Um, you don't have to make quite as many idealizations. So this sort of middle ground, the quasi-linear, it's a second order theory. This is what we use to describe wave particle interactions in the outer radiation belts. And we do it through this kind of um, diffusion type equation. So this is a second order partial differential equation here I've got here. It's known as the Fokker-Planck equation. Um, there's many, many different ways to write it down. It depends what coordinate system you're in. Um, but it has this kind of like, um, kind of format where the um, rate of change of an averaged, um, temporally and spatially averaged F um, is, is given by this second order um, effect. And as I say, depending on what kind of coordinate system you have, there may be other um, coefficients in this particular um, equation, but it's that format. And by writing down the wave particle interactions like this, we can collapse all of this um, outer radiation belt by averaging over the drift of electrons. Sorry, that was the wrong way around. The drift of the electrons going around the outer radiation belt and the bouncing motion of the electrons. We can average all that and end up with a quite simple, relatively speaking, um, simulation that's one dimension in real space. It's just in the radial direction. That's what I'm trying to indicate with this white bar here. Um, and you have other um, uh, coordinates in velocity space 
because this is a kinetic description, but you have one spatial coordinate. And so that makes life a lot easier for, for modeling the um, modeling the, the evolution of the outer radiation belt. So diffusion is the description that we have. It's a second order um, um, equation. So it looks like a diffusion equation, which means that all of the physics is in that one coefficient. It's a diffusion coefficient. Um, there are different diffusion coefficients depending on which, whether you're looking in real space or you're looking in, in velocity space, but that's where all your physics is. So for this style of outer radiation belt model, as I say, the diffusion coefficients contain all the important physics. This means that the important physics are subgrid, um, to use um, a sort of vocabulary from the from the numerical weather prediction community. Um, you're not you're not um, resolving the wave particle interactions exactly. You are describing the long term behavior of the plasma as a result of the wave particle interactions, and so you need a separate model for that. That's where all the physics is. Um, there's two options. You could build a parameterized empirical model using data, and that's largely what is done in the outer radiation belt. You could also run a bunch of idealized numerical models, like the sort of nonlinear models I was talking about, and build a parameterized model with that. That's harder, but may include effects that are important. But I will say that most of the work in the, in the Earth's outer radiation belt right now is um, regards building a parameterized empirical model of those diffusion coefficients using data, using observations. And as I say, there's lots of different ones. Um, the one that I'm showing is DLL there is about diffusion in the radial coordinate. Um, the, uh, the physics of this is that these are ULF waves, so, so ultra low frequency waves between one and 10 millihertz interacting with the drifting electrons that are drifting around the, um, around the Earth. And these waves are largely MHD modes. Um, they're large scale, they're compressional waves or they're alphine waves or they're some kind of combination of the two in the inhomogeneous magnetosphere. Then you've got diffusion in uh, energy space as well. So you've got diffusion in pitch angle, diffusion in energy. There's a cross term as well, but these are higher frequency waves. So ELF or VLF waves, this includes whistle mode waves, emic waves, magnetosonic waves, Z mode waves. When you're at the other planets, there's all other kind of waves that are important. Um, there are a lot of waves out there that can do this um, energy diffusion. When you're constructing the diffusion coefficients, then you, from data, you need wave properties and you need um, plasma properties in order to talk about how efficient or how uh, the efficacy of the, of the wave particle interaction. And uh, most people in their models include something about the spatial variability of the waves too, as they're performing drift averaging and bounce averaging. But what I really want to talk about is the temporal variability. Um, models that, that exist at the moment tend to average over the temporal variability that exists in wave particle interactions. And I've been working lately on figuring out uh, how important the temporal variability is. So this is a usual kind of picture of where different wave modes um, occur in the Earth's magnetosphere that affect the outer radiation belt. So imagine that you're looking down on the North Pole and this is the equatorial plane of the Earth's magnetosphere. You can see the magnetopause um, in this diagram, sorry, the sun is at the top. <laughs> um, but it's different regions that are uh, predominantly uh, um, different kinds of waves have been observed. So whistle mode chorus on the dawn sector here, uh, magnetosonic waves over here, this sort of kidney shaped thing. Um, emic waves probably on the dusk sector. Um, you know, this, the, this is where the waves kind of live. But the diagram sort of makes them appear that they might be uniform. And I think in reality, what's more likely, there's a little pockets of waves that are, um, that are in these, these bigger regions, but there's little pockets of waves that are kind of flashing on and off, uh, doing wave particle interactions and then going away again. Now we're going to remember that quasi-linear theory is an averaging theory. It describes the slow evolution of a spatially averaged F. So if I think about averaging some things over this cube, um, the volume that I choose for that averaging should be relatively uniform plasma and, and magnetic field conditions in order that I can use the theory. Um, and you use average wave properties. Um, and so what time period should you average your wave period, uh, your wave properties over to use this theory? Well, it should be a long, it should be slow compared to the wave period. You should have a few wave periods um, for the average. Is any time scale 
slower than the wave period okay um because some of the models are averaging over years of observations and one of the things i wanted to figure out was 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 that was that good enough or did we need to include faster variability so when you construct a diffusion coefficient for a wave particle interaction, it looks horrific. It looks like this. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we go through this equation in any detail. All I'm saying is highlighting where the observations come in. So you need something about the wave normal angle. You can get that from observations. You need something about the amplitude of the waves. You need something, this lovely function um, requires a is related to the refractive index. So you need the density and the magnetic field and the composition perhaps of the plasma. This resonant condition is identified using, again, the plasma frequency, the gyro frequency, the composition, um, and then the whole range of the integral itself is also obtained from the observation. So there's an, an awful lot of observations that go into these diffusion coefficients. And my big questions are, over which timescales should we be using quasi-linear theory to describe these wave particle interactions? And related to that is how do you construct an accurate model of the diffusion coefficients if you're using a statistical sampling of the magnetosphere. So here's, here's an example where um, Nigel Meredith helped me to compile some data from the Van Allen probes over four years. We chose very, very small bins so that we didn't have any radi radial variation of the quantities and we didn't have very much azimuthal variation. So you can see the bins here, they're sort of in, highlighted in red here. Um, 9 to 10 MLT um, and they're sort of um, very, very thin bins in L star. We compiled sets of observations. So each set had the magnetic field, the number density, um, which you can obtain from Van Allen probes from the upper hybrid frequency measurement. And we uh, scaled all of our diffusion coefficients to the wave intensity that was measured at 252 hertz, which for this region is right where the whistle mode waves happen. And then for each individual set of observations, we constructed a diffusion coefficient. So typically what you would do is average all those individual measurements and then construct a single diffusion coefficient. But we did it the other way around. Take each set of observations and then construct the diffusion coefficient. Now this particular busy slide, sorry about that, is the distributions of diffusion coefficients we got from three different places those three different bins. So there's an L star equals 2.5, L star equals 3, L star equals 3.5. Let's focus on the middle one because I'm largely going to be talking about L star equals 3 here. The diffusion coefficients are constructed for a 0.5 MeV energy electron with a 30 degree angle uh, pitch angle. So diffusion coefficient varies with both energy and pitch angle. So just for so I could show the distribution, I picked one, um, one energy, one pitch angle. So the distributions are very variable. If I calculate any measure of variability, like the, um, uh, the sort of width of the distribution in various spaces, um, various different measures of variance, then they're all big. In fact, when I looked at the L star equals 2.5 case, the, the, some of the measures of variance were infinite. So these are really, really variable distributions is what I'm trying to say. They're also not Gaussian. They're not normal. They are, uh, they're not even log normal. Um, we've done some recent work and they're showing that they're they have statistically very, very heavy tails, um, which is very interesting from a physics perspective, but that's for another talk. Um, we also did a little job in uh, attempting to parameterize these um, distributions by, um, by geomagnetic activity, which is, which is something that we're trying to do with models because it, it, makes it makes it easier. And whilst there is some relationship between average properties of the, of the distribution, sorry, the diffusion coefficients with geomagnetic activity, it's a lot more complicated than just, just, you know, I got more geomagnetic activity, therefore I have more wave particle interactions. So if we're trying to model this distribution that has a lot of variance, then um, there's different methods we can use. And one of the ones I've borrowed from uh, climate models and numerical weather prediction is this idea of stochastic parameterization. So instead of using one diffusion coefficient, um, then it, the stochastic parameterization uh, recognizes that there's natural variability in the system and you basically add that variability into your parameterization. Now this is, I want to emphasize that <coughs> stochastic parameterization is not just a small improvement. It can show you new physics. It can demonstrate that there are new energy pathways. Um, and I have included a slightly controversial quote that I learned in a climate seminar I went to when I was at Reading 
that basically in any nonlinear system, which I'm sure we can agree that, that um, the mini sphere is, observations indicate only one of a range of possible different states. So just because you've measured it didn't mean that that was the only thing that the mini sphere could do. That is slightly controversial, and I am very much looking forward to the chance when we actually get to sit in the pub during a MISS seminar <laughs> or after a MISS seminar and discuss that kind of thing. But it is interesting to imagine that, um, that the variability is real and is in fact a inherent property of the system. And that's what I want to include with the modeling. So to construct a stochastic parameterization, you can use a simplified method where, uh, where you select from the distribution of things that you've measured. That's effectively what I'm going to be talking about today is this sort of simplified measure where I basically have randomly selected from the distribution every time period. And we'll talk a bit about time period in a second. There are other ways to do it. You can use uh, ARMA models, for example, to, to give you smoother transitions so it's not sort of a random time series. Um, but with a stochastic parameterization, you have to run an ensemble because you've got this randomized element in your parameterization. And so you basically have to, to run an ensemble to see how the ensemble behaves. So you no longer have a deterministic solution. So as I say, I was going to talk about time scales here. Um, so we had a look at the measurements we had from those Van Allen probes every single time it came through those bins. So these measurements are from every single time that the Van Allen probe A came through the L star equals three bin that I showed in that diagram. Um, and here's the different things that went into the diffusion coefficients. So we've got magnetic field at the top left. Um, this is a month's worth of data. There's electron number density in the, in the top right. There's um, intensity of the waves in the bottom left and then the diffusion coefficient in the bottom right. So you can see the magnetic field doesn't change very much. L star equals three, you wouldn't expect it to. The number density does. Um, it was kind of interesting that there was, a, there was a storm in the middle of this particular month, which was one of the first months that the Van Allen probes was up there. Uh, you know, a relatively good storm happened at, uh, uh, about the, the 12th, I think, or the 15th of November. Um, and you can see that the number density changes systematically. Um, there's a big reduction in the number density for the rest of the month. Uh, the, wave is, the waves are enormously variable. Um, notice that there are four orders of magnitude on the vertical scale there. So the waves are all over the place. Um, the resulting diffusion coefficient, again, shows a great deal of variability, but there's kind of a... Um, um, it doesn't exactly follow the waves. There's some element of the number density that's come in to, to uh, telling us what's happening with the diffusion coefficient. So that variability is, again, really big. There's more than four orders of magnitude on the vertical scale there. So when I modeled that, we got different results. So the left-hand um, simulation results that I'm showing uh, here are, um, there's five days worth of time going up the vertical axis, so zero to five. Here's pitch angle. And the color that you're seeing is the phase space density um, of electrons that are undergoing pitch angle diffusion as a result of those uh, diffusion coefficients. Um, so here's the loss cone in the dark blue. Um, and then this is the evolution in the upwards direction. Now, this left-hand plot is showing one of those uh, realization of the stochastic parameterization. So it's one of the members of an ensemble. And you can see that it's quite jerky. There's steps in the evolution. There's even a time when uh, the phase space density at some uh, um, pitch angles increases. And this is because the shape of the diffusion coefficient is changing as well as its strength. If I do some averaging of the diffusion coefficients, then I end up with, with these kind of examples in panels B and C. The middle one is where I take all the distribution of diffusion coefficients and I average it. And then I run the whole simulation for five days and find out what happens. So it's a very smooth thing that's going on. Uh, loss cone, there's a gap in the diffusion coefficient here. So there's no change for any pitch angles greater than that. If I average all the inputs to the diffusion coefficient and then calculate one, then I get the same kind of smooth evolution, but it's a lot weaker. It's not as much diffusion if I do it that way. And that's kind of interesting. But what was most interesting out of these numerical experiments is the diffusion itself, the amount of diffusion that happens depends on the variability time scale. So from our um, observations of that month of data from the Van Allen probes, uh, we noticed that the variability time scale had to be something between two minutes, which is how long the spacecraft took to traverse the bin, and nine hours, 
which was how long the sp it took before the spacecraft would come back to that bin. So the time scale that we're looking at for the variability was somewhere in between that. And sadly, because we only had one um, spacecraft to look at at the time, uh, that's, that's as good as we could do. So what I'm showing here is the evolution of the phase space density at pitch angle equals 30 degrees uh, for a range of different numerical experiments. The colors on the top left here are the medians of the ensembles where I did the stochastic parameterization. Yellow is when we varied the diffusion coefficients every two minutes. Red is where we varied the diffusion coefficients every six hours, so somewhere between those two limits that I was talking about. The ensembles of those two numerical experiments are shown at the bottom here. I've got the two minute variation here, and this is the ensemble with the six hour variation, and you can see they're very different. So the two minute variation follows the average of all the, dis the distribution of the diffusion coefficients quite well. So that's the black, the solid black line here is the average of the distribution of the diffusion coefficients. And it follows it quite well. There is some spread. It's not a completely deterministic solution. But if we go to six hours variability, then the, the evolution is completely different. There is a much bigger spread. Many more of the, of the ensemble members reach lower, um, reach lower values of phase-based density, indicating that there's more diffusion going on. And we did a test on the sort of time integrated uh, diffusion coefficient. So over the entire range of the experiment, time integrate the diffusion coefficient for the two hour, the six hour case, sorry, the two minute case, they are pretty much identical. So it's not that this ensemble is experiencing any more or less diffusion in a time integrated sense than this one. It's just doing it in a different, the variability of that diffusion is different. So the results of the ensemble are different. So in, in short, time scales matter. Um, and this is an indication of natural variability. However, I have noticed the time, so I'm going to skip on to the conclusions. Um, we have some more work that um, we've done with ULF waves, which have the same, um, which have the same properties. And I will highlight uh, Reese Thompson's paper from JGR that's just been published this year, uh, which is looking at the same problem, but for UL radial diffusion due to ULF waves. But the thing I really wanted to talk about today was the fact that in radiation belt diffusion, it's not just the amount of um, wave particle interactions going on that can be captured in a diffusion coefficient that, that are important. Actually, the variability of those wave particle interactions are important. So the time scales matter. Reese in his paper showed that the length scales of the variability mattered. And the distribution itself, what shape the distribution has, that matters for the results of your um, diffusion experiment too. So I will leave it there and um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, that was a really nice seminar. Thank you. Got some applauses going around on that. Oh, that's very kind, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was really nicely explained. Um, and just a note about the ULF wave processes. There's some, uh, maybe some interesting posters in Autumn Mist by, for example, Sarah. Yeah, so maybe check out that if you're interested. Um, so now we come to the Q&A session. Um, so if you do have a question, just use the hands up function um, or type it in the chat on Zoom or on Slido. So I'll just give everyone a a sec to ask any questions if they do have any. Yeah, that was really interesting. It's so interesting when you compared like the two minutes to the six hours, how much difference that actually was. They looked completely yeah. different. I, I was really, um, so this is work that I've been doing with Haley Allison at, uh, at GFZ in Potsdam. And we were both surprised like we, we did the experience because we wanted to see what happened when you included the variability. And I don't think either of us were expecting the results. Mm -hmm. um, now explaining the results, that's what we're doing next, but, <laughs> but it is interesting to have found them. Yeah. You know, that the, the timescales are important. Um, we have a question from Nick Watkins. Do you want to just unmute and ask your question, Nick? Hello, yes, indeed. Hello, Claire. Very nice. Hi, Nick. <laughs> nice to see you. I appear to be on uh, at a rather higher altitude than I actually feel. <laughs> but yes, it's been a, um, a couple of questions, actually. Uh, one, can I just, I mean, you, you, you've modelled, um, if, I, if I get it 
understand you correctly, you've got a time dependent D. Is, is, you know, it's an ensemble of Fokker Planck equations, or sorry, an, an ensemble of the same Fokker Planck equation with a yeah. time dependent D. Yes. Is it space dependent as well? I mean, what, what, and can you say anything about the dependence that you chose? You probably did say that, but I didn't really get it. I, I will admit, I will admit that I skipped some of the details. Um, yeah. So, uh, yes, the, in the ensembles, the Ds are both time dependent and in this case, pitch angle dependent. That's sort of my okay. space, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're pitch angle models. So, yes, they, they, they include that pitch angle changes because from the observations, we discovered that, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious in hindsight, but um, if you use uh, specific sets of wave properties and, and kind of plasma properties, you end up with diffusion coefficients that have different shapes um, yeah, in okay. pitch angle. Yeah. Yeah. So we included that. Um, so as, you, as each of these Fokker-Planck experiments has a different kind of time history yeah. of D, which varies with A, with alpha, yeah. with the pitch angle. Yeah. Okay. And and uh, again, you might have said this, but is this published somewhere yet, or are you still writing this out? It's it, it's under review, but we kind review. of got okay. to the stage yeah. where it's nearly where we reckon it's nearly there. So that's why <laughs> I talked it, about it, it today. It needs a little <laughs> a, a little a little impulse of its own, I imagine. But yeah. Okay. Uh, and the other the other question, uh, I mean, you did say it's another talk, but I mean, can you even just say a little bit about these heavy tails? These are these are heavy tails in the particle PDFs or what? I um, know uh, these are heavy tails in the diffusion coefficients themselves. OK, um, the, so okay. when we started studying the diffusion coefficients, yeah. um, yes, they they are. They have statistically heavy tails. This is as, as a result. In part, because the wave activity when you look at the distribution of the wave activity, it has a statistically heavy tail. And it's looking like they're things like stretched exponentials, although I'm saying that as a preliminary result because I haven't done an exhaustive. Sure, no, okay. And, but they, they like would be, like yeah, they'd be sort of, I mean, heavy in the sense of shallow, so they'd be shallower than something like a Kappa distribution, for yes. example, is, yep. is what you're saying, yeah. Okay. That's exactly what right. I'm saying, yeah. Okay, right, no, that's, that's great, thank you. Cheers. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, next question is from um, Sam Walton. Sam, do you want to unmute now? Um, so this might kind of like be a million dollar question, but what do you have any sense of what happens between the sort of two minute and the nine hour time scales? Is that anything that... Not yet. Um, basically, that, that's our next, as I say, I've been running these experiments with Haley and we're discussing the next things to do. And yeah, we're going to follow up with somewhere between. Um, and additionally, some work that I've been doing with uh, Shui Zhang, who's um, a PhD student working with Johnny, uh, he's from Shandong. Uh, we've actually been trying to identify the temporal scale <laughs> of different waves, uh, which you can do with multi-spacecraft uh, measurements. So um, yeah, we've been trying to sort of hone what the temporal scale might be using observations. And yeah, Haley and I are going to run more experiments looking at that range of um that range of time scales yeah okay great thanks thanks sam um any other questions don't be shy um if not then i can ask my question <laughs> um some of the distribution plots you showed were for nine to ten mlt and i was just curious whether you saw the same trends across all MLT or whether there were any interesting differences? Haven't, um, we haven't looked at that yet. So as I mentioned, this the data part is stuff that I've been working with Nigel Meredith at Bass um, on. And uh, we basically have thousands of observations in the three bins that we looked at so far. And what we were doing was almost a pilot study, you know, um, how do things vary? Is that variability important? I mean, thankfully, things vary a lot and the variability does seem to be important. So that's good. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's kind of a next step too. Um, one of the things that I'm very excited about this work is that the future directions are kind of, they've, they've, they've gone a bit crazy. So yeah, looking at the MLT distribution um, and the radial distribution, uh, we've only looked at plasmaspheric hiss. I didn't really mention that, you know, we haven't looked at um, 
any of the other myriad of ways that there are out there. Um, so there's there's a lot to do now, um, and it will be really interesting to see how how rapidly things vary with with say radial distance or with MLT. That sounds good. Yeah, I think it would be really interesting to look at MLT because in terms of like just even the background density, that's going to be very different right. conditions from one MLT sector to the next. Exactly. Exactly. You're, you're so right. I mean, it, it, the the one of the things that the I mean, other people know this. I didn't know this until I did the study, but the how important number density is. Um, and where you have um, the sort of number density kind of uh, rippling in azimuth, let's say, or, you know, I was trying to say at the beginning of the talk that we often draw the smooth pictures because they're helpful. Um, but the real magnetosphere is, um, has these big, um, the sort of turbulent structures or, um, or, or wavy structures that are happening on big, big scales. And that could be important. You could imagine the situation where you had waves um, existing over a large portion of the magnetosphere, but because the number density varies in particular ways, the waves are more effective in some places than they are in the others. And so as far as the, as the radiation belts are concerned, they're just interested about where those wave particle interactions are effective. So it, yeah, there's lots of convolutions of things and it's great. It's really interesting. Um, thanks, Claire. Um, any other questions? Oh, John doesn't have a question, but he would love a link to the Heavy Tails paper. Yes, so uh, we kind of alluded to the Heavy Tails so far. I am working on um, on identifying the nature of the different distributions that we're we're looking at, um, and that's that's kind of a work in progress. But I'll keep you posted, John. <laughs> He's on the waiting list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you've got another question, put your hand up or type it in the chat. Everyone's being very quiet today. No? Okay. Might might need to wrap up there then if no one's got any more questions. Oh, I did actually have one more question, seeing as no one else is asking. <laughs> <laughs> it's chair's prerogative, right? Um, when you um, looked at the plasma spheric hiss, I think it was, you um, looked at the corresponding number density from the emphasis instrument. Um, I'm not that familiar with hiss, but would it, would the um, changes in or the local ion composition, so the mass density, be important or is that not so much a factor for hiss? They're not as much for hiss. I was talking to Sarah Glowert about this, who's and, and Richard Horn, obviously, who've, who've you know um, studied these diffusion coefficients quite a lot. Um, so the composition doesn't make a huge amount of difference for hiss, but does make a difference for wave particle interactions for other modes like emic waves. So if one was constructing um, a distribution of diffusion coefficients for emic waves, then I would have like. I think it's sensible to include the composition information. So when I was talking about constructing sets of observations from which to construct each individual diffusion coefficient, then yeah, I think I think composition would be important for things like emic waves, and there's a chance for magnetosonic waves as well. I just I've just forgotten. Okay, but yeah, I think that is important. Um, thanks. I feel like I'm asking all the questions. Answer <laughs> the question. Hi. Um... Go ahead, Richard. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. <clears throat> Claire, it's a lovely, it was a lovely seminar. It's a really nice talk. Um, just wanted to ask perhaps your views on um, going to a 4D type model. So for example, I know that we, the, the model you, I think you were referring to have, has for the three dimensions, you know, uh, L, L star, um, pitch angle energy, okay? But we know that the particles drift around the earth all the way around. They encounter waves at different magnetic local times. Yeah. And the plasma properties change in all those different local times. And that's clearly, you know, part of the variability that you are talking about. So in your view, how, you know, how important is it to go to this extra dimension and take all that kind of variability in, in, into account or, how reasonable is it to actually continue just averaging it in local time? So, so I, I when thinking about um, extending the dimensions in the past, it makes sense for the the sort of um, higher frequency wave particle interactions that are happening in 
velocity space, perhaps. Um, what we haven't done yet is um, numerical experiments where we kind of think of, let's say, how um, high energy particles are drifting around the earth and what they're encountering, because effectively you could construct um, a sort of time dependent diffusion coefficient that was actually tied to the drift motion of the electrons and not just you know, the, t the temporal variability of the waves because there's sort of two time scales going on. Um, we haven't done that yet because I don't know what the MLT variation of the waves is yet. So, so obviously, you know, that, that's for the future. Um, but on the flip side of that, and I think that, you know, you and I have talked about this in, in, in other um, situations, is how do you include diffusion due to something like a ULF wave, the radial diffusion due to ULF waves, um, which is by definition drift averaged. So the radial diffusion is happening on timescales that, that are longer than the drift average. And it almost doesn't really make sense to me to talk about radial diffusion if I haven't done that averaging step. So I guess the answer to your question is what I'd always hoped secretly is that one could include the, the kind of uh, the variability, the azimuthal variability of the wave particle interaction um, into your model of the diffusion coefficient and stick with a 3D description because I don't see how to include the, 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 the ULF diffusion otherwise. I don't know how to do it because you'd sort of have to, you'd have to do drift averaging for one but not for the other and that, that seems painful to me. <laughs> um, so that that's kind of, you know, when I was saying that that that, that most of the physics are in the diffusion coefficients. So there's an awful lot of physics in those diffusion coefficients, and you could construct them, because I mean, right now you guys at Bass construct your diffusion coefficients such that they are drift averaged, yeah. and that makes sense. Yeah. But how about when constructing those drift averages, you could include the temporal variability as well as the azimuthal variability in some way that is constrained by observations. And you could still construct a temporal varying, temporarily varying D and that I was talking about with Nick um, about, you could still construct that, but it would include that as a muscle variability. I think, you, I think you could do that. I think that would be the easier way to do it. Yeah, thank, thanks. I, I mean, I think, I think the point you made about the ULF waves is really, really important. You know, that you've got to have several drift, you've got to have a number of drift Paths all the way around for the concept of radial diffusion to, to, to work. Yeah. Um, and yet, on that time scale, you could have uh, you know, some very patches of very um, strong pitch angle diffusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Regionally. So I agree. I, I, it's, and it's always worried me. It's always really worried me that, you know, we could have, I don't know, some EMIC waves that cause very strong diffusion in one region and we're averaging it out. It's, right. Yes, it's, exactly. It's, and so, it's, so it's, it's a question of how one constructs those averages. Um, I think is that, that, that this work on variability can hopefully help us to, to, to think yeah. about, or indeed maybe an average isn't always useful and you do want some information about the, the kind of potential extremes of the behavior that can happen because one of the things we noticed in the numerical experiments is that I was showing that the, the, in the ensemble case, the kind of steps in the evolution. And basically that's, that's, every time you see a step is when one of the big diffusion coefficients have been chosen. And they're basically, that's where all the action happens. That's when the big ones happen. Otherwise they're pretty, they're pretty flat because the, the diffusion coefficient that's been chosen is small because most of them are small. So you have these um, rare occurrences of very strong diffusion. And that's those rare occurrences govern the behavior of the, of the ensemble. Um, and so, as I was saying, if, if we actually can construct distributions of all of these things, which I know is a tall order, but why not? Um, if we could, then we have information about those, those um those very extreme events. And I think that we can figure out modeling strategies that can include them. So, so you're not averaging them out. You're not kind of diminishing the, the, the action of those extreme cases. You're using that information to tell you, you know, to, to construct a model.
So that's kind of the plan. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, we've just slipped past 12 o'clock, so we should probably wrap up now. Um, yeah, thanks for everyone who asked questions. That was a really interesting discussion session. Um, and thank you to Claire for an excellent seminar. And thank you to everyone who attended. I hope you all got something from it. Um, yeah, that's everything. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Um, okay, that's great. Hope you all have a nice day. Bye.